and welcome to Chairside Live. I'm Megan Strong. And I'm Will Schmidt, Registered Dental Assistant here at Glidewell Dental. Will, it is a very exciting show today. Tell me why you're excited. Okay, well here's why I'm excited. The owner and founder of Dental Town Magazine and Dentaltown.com, Dr. Howard Ferran, he's sitting down with the man himself, Mr. Jim Glidewell, for an exclusive conversation that you won't hear anywhere else. There's two parts to it, so what do you say we start off part one? I mean, the two most influential people in dentistry in the same room together? Woo! Let's get it started, why not? Let's go. It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing the largest legend in all of dentistry, James R. Glidewell, Thank Jim so Glidewell. Um, it is just truly amazing. I, I gotta tell you, um, I always thought of you as Herb Kelleher, who passed away um, um, last year. In the Southwest, um, yeah. Southwest Airlines. Um, when I started lecturing um, airlines, it, it was for rich people. And, and the planes were empty and everybody was dressed nicely and it was a rich man's game. And Herb Kelleher said, um, you know, I'm going to keep one eye on the customer and one eye on cost. And I'm going to use my brain to drive down cost until grandma has the freedom to afford to fly. And when I came out of school, um, not to throw anybody under a bus, um, but, but when I started taking continuing education, you know, I, I started first at the Panky Institute. And day one is this lecture, and love the guy, and I, I, and I understand market segmentation, Mercedes Benz, all this stuff, but he, he talked about how you just want to focus on A patients. And Erwin Becker gave this whole presentation about what an A patient was. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, I'm from Kansas. I don't have one cousin, nephew, sister, mom. None of us made the A list, the B list. We were all C, D, F list. And, and I kind of got this um, icky feeling that um, American dentistry was trying to make stuff for the rich people. And, and that's not what America was built on. I mean, Henry Ford said, if you made cars for the, the classes, yeah. You're, you're going to be poor and live with the masses. He says, America is about making stuff to the masses. And you were just hell bent on keeping your eye on cost so that the average working man could save his tooth. And so for I, it was yeah. love at first sight. Well, the, me and you. Uh, uh, and speaking of Henry Ford, you know, he always says it's, it's not what you can get for a dollar, but what you can give for a dollar. In other words, you want to give the most value for a dollar always. And uh, I've always believed in that. And then when I found out that only maybe 50% of the American public kind of really visit a dentist, I says, why is that? Well, it's cost prohibitive. And so how can we enlarge that marketplace? And so I've, that's what I've always done. In fact, I think all of my employees will tell you that every day I come to work is how do I drive down the cost of what we do? And we've been able to drive down cost immeasurably because we've always been, uh, I'm not going to say low cost, I always use the term, hey, we're kind of a Walmart. And my employees always fight me, they say, no, we're Costco, you know, kind of a classy thing called Costco. And I said, maybe so, but the, the real thing is that we're going to keep dropping the prices on products as we get more and more efficient at producing them because we're not really trying to put money in our pocket, we're trying to lower the cost of dentistry so all patients, more patients, can afford dentistry. That's really it in a nutshell. You know, it's funny you said um, Henry Ford, it's not what you can get for a dollar, it's what you can get for a dollar. The only other person I ever heard say that in my whole life was Ken Austin of ADEC, who mm -hmm. passed away uh, last year, and his wife Joanne. And um, same, he was a big Henry Ford um, deal. And what he liked about Henry Ford is that if you're driving a, a Model T and it broke down, you could go find a 20 year old Model T in somebody's creek and ditch and the same part would work. Parts interchangeable, and he yeah. was he was so um, mostly motivated on those ADEC chairs that the whole chair um, only once did he have to change uh, the, the internal structure, and that was because as Americans got bigger and bigger and heavier and heavier, you lean back and fall over, so he had to put a much bigger base. Um, but he he was like you, a, a, a detail for manufacturing, just totally manufacturing. Um, but I, I want I want you to start with the original story because you're born in Vegas, moved uh, born in to... born in Las Vegas. Uh, by four years of old, my father was having a hard time supporting my my sister and I, so he sent me to Kentucky to live with my grandparents, and I lived on a subsistence farm in southern Kentucky, and I. Be, 
went to school and What's I went, a subsistence farm? Uh, it's where you grow your own vegetables out back and you, you have two pigs. Usually you slaughter two pigs and you have a smokehouse. No indoor plumbing and no water, no electricity. This is back in 1950 through 55. The TVA had not kicked uh, electric power up into the southern part of Kentucky I was in until 1957. After the Tennessee Valley Authority? Yeah, Tennessee Valley Authority uh, got the power up there about 1957. But uh, we had no electricity, we just had kerosene lamps. And uh, there was some kind of a little device we used to crank on, we could get a radio to work, so we could hear Amos and Andy on the radio or something, you know. And it was really quite, uh, you know, I think that when you're a kid, you, you think you're well off. We didn't, of course, we didn't have a car or anything like that. But uh, I felt like we were, we were fine. We had a little tobacco subsidy, which everybody in the South has. And so we had just a little bit of money. But anyway, by the time I was 10 years old, I returned to Las Vegas, where I was born, and uh, continued on through regular school. And so it was kind of a simple upbringing. I, I was a terrible student in school. I mean, I, was, uh, I wasn't the bottom of my class, but I was 328 out of 331 out of Las Vegas High School. 328 uh, on 331? Yeah, and I always regret that I worked so hard. I should have, uh, I should have worked not quite so hard. It could have been 331. <laughs> but um, so I, at that point, right after high school, I just turned 18 at the same time, and I joined the Navy, and I went to Vietnam, basically, and came back in July 1965 with a whole new outlook on life. You know, the military in Vietnam had a chance to kind of shape, uh, shape you somewhat. And so uh, I went, and I didn't have a lot of parentage. My parents were gone most all the time, and they, so I kind of raised myself. Cause my father was a railroader, and he was gone three days at a time, and my mother was an accomplished uh, gambler and whatnot in Las Vegas. I didn't see her very often either, my stepmother, but nice lady. So coming back from Vietnam, I, I went to work for Delta, and uh, Delta Airlines, and ramp fueling airplanes, and then I went to become an insurance agent. When I, the day I turned 21, I took the test, became an insurance agent, and then within about a month or something, I sold an insurance policy to a dental technician named Rex Frainer, who will always be in my heart, high school buddy. And he uh, uh, told me all about what he was doing, and I just thought it looked like an honest business, something you make with your hands and you get paid for it, you know? And I didn't really like contracts. I didn't want signing contracts, which was, I wasn't gonna make a living signing contracts, which was the insurance business. So I right away looked at, and I was able to go to Orange Coast College in California here, in Costa Mesa, uh, on the GI Bill. So I got $175 a month to go to school. Got a job at Sears and Roebuck selling suits. Worked my way through uh, school for about a year, and then I got a job in a dental lab for a few months. Then I went to work for a dentist uh, named Bill Stanley in in Orange. Well, we, no, we were in uh, Santa Ana. And Bill he, Stanley. Bill Stanley was a dentist at a USC. Does six, he have a kid named Stanley, a young guy? Uh, no. There's a famous Kyle no. Stanley today. Oh, uh, yeah. And no, he, oh, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> uh, no, uh, not a golfer. You're thinking about Kyle Stanley, the golfer, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Um, Bill was a tough run up guy. He was from Tennessee. He, was just, he had the same background I did, and when I met him, I just loved the guy. And uh, I worked for him for about a year and a half, but he worked his way through dental school, USC, as a dental technician. So he really taught me the business, even though I went to a school. Uh, I was, so I you went fingered. to the school? I went is to the it, school, but they, they call the school. No, it's not. It closed uh, 10 years later, maybe. Yeah. There wasn't any jobs for technicians. You know, you, you go to school and you get out and you still couldn't find a job. So they finally they, they realized it wasn't working. So then Bill uh, taught me everything I know. And then one day he came to me and he said, by the way, we've got to get out of here because I haven't been able to pay the rent. And uh, I said, well, how much time have we got? He said, oh, 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> so that brings us where we are today. It's 50 years of being in business, because uh, Bill said, we gotta go. I said, where are we gonna go? And Bill, Bill says, there's no we in this. I'm going to LA to get a job, and I don't know where you're going. So I was kind of thrown out in the street. He's a dear friend of mine, by the way. We, yeah. we are absolutely close, close so, friends. So let, let, let's go back to that, that um, decision. Um, the dental schools, they all added hygiene departments and yeah. closed down their, their Cran and Bridge deals. And yeah. um, so I knew, 
labs. So I was born and raised in Kansas, went to Creighton and Nebraska, and uh -huh. the, these little crown and bridges, I would say, well, I've, I've had a, uh, an ad in the local newspaper for six months for a porcelain stacker. Right, yeah. But they're, they, they, they quit training them. What, what do you think of that um, decision? What, why did dental schools add hygienist and take away labs? Because when I lectured in um, Hong Kong yeah. um, not very long ago, um, they had a dental school and a crown and bridge Deal and the, and the, the dental laboratory class was, I think, 400, and the dentist class was 100, and they didn't even have hygienists. Yeah. So why, why, did, why is well, China... I think when a dentist opens an office in the United States, he's going to need an assistant, and he can have a, a hygienist on staff, but he would, doesn't necessarily have a dental technician. They always use some outside lab. So that's kind of outside their immediate focus when they're trying to run a, their own little business and everything. So uh, I think that's... They just... We, we were able to train people to be technicians. It wasn't a very organized training method. When I went to school, I was taught dental technology uh, ceramics by a denture technician because the school that hired a denture technician set up guy to teach these classes. They didn't know. They said, you a dental technician? Sure. You know, well, teach this class on, and, and the guy look, how do you make a crown? I don't know, but I can set up a denture. But anyway, so I realized early on I was going to have to teach myself. Then I met uh, the dentist, uh, Bill uh, Stanley, and boy, he, was, he, was, he knew what he was doing. He told me about you know, contacts and occlusion and how to trim margins and do it right. And, and so I was pretty good at it. And I also taught myself ceramics because in 1968, 69, there were no real ceramists in Orange County. That maybe it was four or five. They came several hundred, but there was only four or five at that time. So. Um, I went to a class one time where they were selling instruments. I just watched this guy pack porcelain and I thought, I can do that. I went home and made every mistake there was, but I eventually became good at it. I, I love the clarity in what you said is uh, you wanted to have an honest work and an honest living. And honest work is working with your hands. Yes. Uh -huh. If you're a welder, you're a dentist, you're, you're a, a dentist, surgeon. Yeah, absolutely. And so much of society has gone to just sitting at a computer, contracts, writing, and and um, it, it scares me that we live in a country that no one wants to make anything. No one wants to work in their hands. They think they're all going to yeah. buy it from another country. That's right. And that they're going to work with their hands and make something, and we're just going to give them a piece of paper, and they're going to be good with that. And that looks very short-sighted. Well, I've always, uh, uh, my Vietnam experience was interesting in that <clears throat> I came home uninjured except in my head, and... I had lost two or three of my high school buddies over in Vietnam. Not in where I was at, but, you know, I got home and, hey, where's Jerry? Where's Joe? You know, and, and I decided that they didn't have the opportunities going forward that I was going to have and that I would work on their behalf. It's kind of hard to understand how my brain works. Um, <clears throat> I get emotional about it. Sometimes it's hard to talk about, but they weren't here anymore. And yet, I was. So why not work as hard as I possibly can? And even today, as I sit here, I'm 74 years old. 50 years, started my company, 24, 50 years, and I'm 74. I could have quit many years ago. It certainly has nothing to do with money. But I remember my commitment to the people in that didn't come home, the commitment to employees. When the first girl walked into my office who was an employee, I had my little dental lab and I needed somebody from my class to come and help me. She walked in and, and I realized that I was responsible for her career, that she would look to me as the boss and she was going to have a career at my little dental lab. And I thought, my gosh, that's a, that's a heavy burden. You know, it's a heavy burden to say, I'm not responsible for her needs. And as you can see today, um, here we sit here today and I have 5,000 people with needs. And that's why I can't even retire now. I worry every day I'm going to screw up. You know, that I'm coming to work, I've got to keep building this for them, for these cameramen and everybody that works in our company. I have to keep going. And I, I worry, as I mean, Herb Kelleher and Mr. Austin, you know, I worry, I know what happened to them. They ran out of time. And I am at, you know, my age too. I, I worry that I don't have enough time to accomplish all the things I think need to be done for dentistry. Is your Vietnam experience also why there's a lot of Vietnamese people working in Glidewell Laboratory? 
Yeah, I would think so uh, to, to a degree. Um, we live, by the way, in an area around here where there's many eth ethnicities, and we have at this company 68 different ethnic backgrounds. When this afternoon, I'll show you on the wall, we have a wall of flags that are at a building, and we have 68 flags on that wall. Um, but I felt over here that they were not respected enough, and that I thought I would take care of that community, and I've done a pretty good job. Because I think we have, I mean, several hundred Vietnamese working in the company. That is amazing. Um, so, it, it, so when I got out of school, the um, it, it's kind of weird because the fillings were um, silver fillings, and they yeah. were, so they were half mercury. The other half was silver, zinc, copper, and tin, all antibacterial stuff, and they lasted forever, and they were cheap. And the gold, um, something about the gold, bacteria just don't like to live under exactly. that, you know, high energy An gold. open margin seems to last forever. I, I, I have patients in Phoenix that have gold foils where you can see loops through them yeah. on 80-year-old women. Yeah. And you can see, and there's no decay. No decay, yeah. And then this, um, the cosmetic revolution came along and said, you know those 38 year long lasting low cost silver fillings. I want that to be replaced with cheap white inert plastic. And that um, that crown, I want it to, it just looks is the only thing that matters. Um, I've, we've, we, we've always called the aesthetic health compromise. I mean, and you would say to him, do, do you want a silver filling that'll last 38 years for a hundred? Or do you want a white plastic tooth colored one for 200 that'll last seven years. And they say, I'll, I'll take the white. It's Always, like, yeah. It's like, so So what uh, What are, uh, do, you, do you think that someday um, something will happen to that crown that will be like a gold crown to where um, it will, you know, things won't want to live underneath it. it we, we, we talk about bridge like we're a mechanical engineer, but we're really biologists. Mm -hmm. You build a barn and you tell them, every day I want you to wash and wax the barn and you take care of the barn, but at the end of the day, termites are gonna eat the whole barn. Right, yeah. um, gold and amalgam um, termites. They've proven their place. They, 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 yeah. they, they stop biology invasion. Do, do yeah. you think the two-colored well, crown will I, ever do that? I, Maybe not to the de that degree, but we're only into zirconia about 10 years, eh, or 12 years into zirconia now. And so far we've seen, in well, incredible strength. You know, they just don't break. Uh, but as far as the biology going on there, I really don't know. I, I can't say, haven't seen any negatives at all, but I can't say we've seen any negatives whatsoever. But the one thing that, uh, as a dental laboratory, we came up with zirconia because all we saw the vendors handing us was more and more expensive white filling materials. You know, when lava came out from uh, 3M, it was a very nice product and everything, but just a coping of materials and a coping were $60 for us. And we used to put a dollar's worth of Ceramco porcelain on a crown. Now all of a sudden we got a $60 coping. And uh, they were selling like crazy and people are buying into the concept that you need this product and all that. But we laboratory, all of a sudden, our lab fees started going up and up and up as vendors wanted to get more and more into that lab fee. And so I decided, and if you look around it today when I show you this through this place, we make almost all of our own materials. We make our own lithium silicate materials. We make our own zirconia here. Uh, we make our own amount, uh, composite materials here. Um, we don't do powdered metal. We used to, uh, but we don't make powdered metal for selective laser centering of copings whatnot. But we do build, basically build almost everything here. We, we build our own milling machines. I'll show you milling so, machines. So why, so why do so many companies, um, it, it's, it's like they, they know they are gonna make something more expensive for less people. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at the winners, um, who's the, the number one airline? Southwest, Walmart, yeah. Costco, number one furniture, Ikea. Um, why is it so obvious that the person who keeps one eye on the customer and one eye on cost and uses their brain to drive down costs so their customer can afford the freedom mm. to buy your product, why are guys like well, you, why, why, why is that, why does everyone not understand that? We're a vertically integrated company and we know that if we can save money on materials, we can lower the invoice, therefore we get more market share. And that's really what's happened at Walmart, Costco and these different companies, these big box places. The new guys coming into the dentistry, and I could say even like, uh, well, Smile Club Direct, uh, uh, Bite, there's a several of them out there that are uh, you know, in the invisible brace business today. Most of them are venture capital based. 
you know, they're backed by VC guys and they've got an exit strategy and it says, you know, we're going to hit our, our gold mine here in two years or three years, we've got a way out. I don't see a way out. What, what I do is I don't see any way out of what we're doing. We, we have to continue growing, making it better all the time, making it less expensive all the time. And as people will tell you about me, you know, when they ask me what my exit strategy is, I say it's, it's death. It's a pine box. It's a pine box. <laughs> That's how I get out. I got no venture capital guys saying, hey, come on, let's speed it up here. I need to get out of this thing. No, we, we don't have that. And we, we have a continuity program going on here at the company where people will back me when I'm gone. Uh, but I, I'm a strategic planner more than anything else anymore. Actually, you won't believe this, but I haven't made a crown in a few years. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I just got a text. I have to see patients uh, when I get back home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but by being vertically integrated, our costs are extremely low. I mean, I I buy materials uh, probably thirty percent of what it costs. In it, dental explain lab vertically materials. integrated. A lot, a lot of my listeners. Well, vertically integrated means like you're sitting here in a studio today with all my uh, really expensive camera gear, and it all belongs to Glidewell Laboratories. So we're, we are shooting our own videos. We don't go out and pay somebody, you know, $1,500 an hour to come in and do video for us. We're here all the time. And the reason I do that is because I know if you have a tool, you'll use it more often than if you rent it. If you start to rent things and everybody says, oh, you just rent that stuff, you don't need it. It's like our real estate. We own most all of our, you know that we have almost one million square foot of real estate. We either own, it is a million, uh, we either own probably 80% of it or we rent the rest. And the reason I wanted to own the real estate is because if I need to change walls in our business, we've got plumbing everywhere, electrical, and you go into a standard business office and you ask the uh, landlord, just, can we drill a hole here and put a pipe in here? As you know, in dentistry, we're putting pipes everywhere and air, you know, and air so compressors. From that perspective, and I, the Pentagon is one million square feet. Yeah. So you're the size that. of the Pentagon. I didn't Pentagon. know that. Yeah, when, you know, this building here is only, this building is 75,000 feet. And then you go over here to our other campus and there's 100,000, 100,000, uh, 251,000, 100,000. Uh, we'll show you uh, 20 some acres over there, right across from the airport, airport here that we own. That is, that's a lot of our stuff. Now we also have offices in South America and whatnot. I, we're buying a building in Mexico City right now, too, because we really want to control our destiny. We had an office in Las Vegas that my uh, son-in-law and my, my daughter run up there in Las Vegas, and we were asking permission to throw a pipe in the floor you know, for a drain, and it's not going to happen, and yet we really needed it, so because I went and bought another Indians building. Because of well, uh, No, the, the landlords just don't want you to cut the floor or make any changes to the building, and they have the right to do that. Huh. All of a sudden, I need that though for. A now you used to have a place in business. Costa Rica. You used Still to take do. your boat down there. Uh, I here, did. I from did. here to there, you'd sail. Yeah, there. but I've never been to my office in Costa Rica. You never been there? No. I've never been to my office in Tijuana or Mexico City or Colombia or Chile. I've been to the office in Las Vegas because my daughter's there sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I don't visit my offices because I. I tell them what I think how a business should be run, but if I show up all the time, they expect me to make the decisions. Oh, well, Jim's coming, he'll make that decision. So if I just one, stay away, they, they make their own decisions. One question about your, your customer, the dentist, um, private equity. Um, a lot of the kids that are listening right now, a quarter of them are in dental school and they're all under 30. Mm -hmm. um, send me an email, Howard at dentaltown.com and tell me um, where you're from, what country. But a lot of them say, they, they look at two old guys like us, they say, Howard and Jim, when, when you guys were little, all the pharmacists owned their own business. Now they're all work at CVS and Walmart. Uh, they see Heartland, um, um, yeah, Pacific. they see Pacific, they see uh, Bob Fontana with Aspen, all of them now coming up on a thousand offices and they say, hey, when they're our age, is private independent dentist gone? Are we all gonna be working at McDentals? I have a feeling that McDental is what's coming. Uh, also, when they get out of school, you know, uh, uh, it takes a while to get your maturity together, you know, and become a real journeyman at this business. And I think Aspen, Pacific, Heartland, uh, they all perform a pretty good service. You know, I think that they've got a, they're a good training ground, you know, um, clear choice, all of them. You know, there's 
So you think you think that will? So how? Yeah, uh, it's what change percent hesitant. is it? I mean, what percent is it now? And what do you think it'll be at 10, 20, 30 years? Um, or, or this is your 50th anniversary. Say, what will it be? 50 years? Yeah, from now? 50 years from now, it's going to be. I'm going to think it's going to be 25 percent independent practices in small rural areas, and all the citified areas are going to be um, McDonald offices. That's a personal In 50 thing. years? Yeah. 75, 25? Yeah, I think, I think you're going to have some outlying areas out there where there's, you know, the population density is going to be uh, less than 1,000 in, say, a uh, 25-mile radius, and you're going to have one or two little offices in that area. But... And, and why, why, why do you... Why do you um, what, what is your intuition that makes you think that... That's well, it's from uh, we work for a lot of small town dentists today, so we're looking at. I wonder why these guys send us work. Well, they don't have a dental lab around because there's only two of them in a hundred miles. So I'm going to go to um, chairside milling. Um, it, it came out. Um, it was the 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 CAD CAM, and, and of course, it was a you know a hundred and forty thousand dollar machine. I mean, Patterson's always done this. I remember when I got out of school, I bought the first intro camera as a Fuji cam. It was thirty eight thousand dollars. It wasn't even three or four years, and other people were selling it for ten thousand yeah. um, dollars. So they came out with their 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 CAD cam. It was a uh, um, uh, their CAD cam. It was um, one hundred and forty five thousand dollars, and I'd be lecturing in other countries and where you could see them in Germany and and Asia for half that price. Um, but it but it but the end of the day, it didn't really seem to take off. I mean, uh, the numbers I see only about twelve percent of dentists um, were, are using the Serona CAD CAM to chairside milling. So if twelve percent are using, it means eighty eight percent are. No, not and, yeah. And when other things came out, like when radiog when radiology came out, everybody got an X ray machine. Um, some technologies, you know, really spread fast. So what what is your what was your thoughts on? Um, CAD CAM, Serona CAD CAM, and why why did it yeah, when not I th- really take back off? Back in the uh, late 70s, uh, I had the opportunity to run into Francois Duray from, from France, France, and he came over here to USC, and uh, gosh darn, I can't remember the gentleman's name out here, uh, the dentist they tied up with, but they're going around doing seminars on how to use CAD CAM to machine gold crowns. And uh, it's just falling on deaf ears a lot because it was way, way before its time. But I still, to this day, I think of Francois Dure as being the, uh, the father of CAD CAM dentistry. Uh, and he has a system out right now, I understand, but I don't really know the name of it, truthfully. I, I've forgotten right now because there's about eight or ten out there competing with cameras and whatnot. And the lawsuits are flying back and forth, you know. <laughs> but um, so I've always been interested in it. And, I, and I, I, truthfully, when it first came out, I said, no way, this can't be done. So... I also said the same thing with the fax machine, by the way. A guy came to me one time to sell me a fax machine. I said, that is a really ridiculous idea. You know, within about four years, it was all over the United States. And I was, uh, I was but I wouldn't change my mind. You know, I'm seldom right, but never in doubt. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, but I think when I first saw it come out, I thought, well, something will come of it. And then it picked up, you know, Serona uh, did a pretty good job of bringing it out. And for those that were like the idea it was great. The problem that I saw with it, and I've still seen with it, is that there's a lot of tissue in the mouth that hangs over margins, and you know the intraoral scanners can only see what it can see, and so then to use the tool, sometimes you have to use an electrosurge to open up the field so that you can actually see the the margins. And I thought, wow, you got to do surgery to use a tool, and I thought, that's kind of a crazy thing. So I really think, um, as much as I like. Okay, Kevin, obviously I'm in it, in the Glidewell I.O. system. Uh, but there's a big, big market out there still for uh, polyvinyl siloxane. It'll be around a long time. I'm, I'm positive of it. Well, I'm so, um, you know, um, you remember uh, Jim Miles, the CEO of uh, Densply? Sure. Love that guy. He yeah, had the biggest yeah. boat on Chesapeake Bay. Yeah, you know that? yeah, yeah. His I wife was, was from Puerto Rico, so he yeah. bought a boat that could literally go from Chesapeake Bay to Puerto All Rico. All the way to, to Puerto Rico, yeah. And um, he said, I asked him one day at dinner, I said, what's the greatest thing about dentistry? And he goes, dentists are so brand loyal. He said, man, he, got, he said, they got so many things going wrong that if something works, they're not changing that. Never change it. And yeah. I think about that. I started out on Impergum mm-hmm. when it was in, made in Germany, and now it's about by three. I'm still, 32 years later, I'm still using Impergum. Um, d- you know, what, what, why do you think that is? Yeah, the brand loyalty, I, well, I think, a dentist or running a practice has so many decision points 
There's so many things that he has to stay loyal to that, and he's moving on to something else. I mean, he, you don't get bored in dentistry. You get overwhelmed, I think. Yeah. And so I think that's why uh, people, then there's the innovative guys that, that want to try the thing like, uh, you know, the 12% that are using Serona. Um, I just, as you do, I mean, I thought it was extremely expensive. I liked the idea. I was building machines to uh, do uh, zirconia milling, and I said, well, I can build a machine that's six foot tall to do zirconia. Why can't I make a, a small machine that'll do that, you know, do something else? And everybody thought I was having these made in China or something, but I'll show you today. I make everything right here, right here in Irvine, California. Uh, and we have... What we have like I have like 15 PhDs on staff, another 25 in, uh, industrial engineers that design mechanical engineers that design all these things. Minimally a hundred software writers that write all the software we have over. And you and you've been hiring software writers in um, Python, which is artificial intelligence language. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I did a podcast interview with a guy in um, artificial intelligence who was just mesmerized by what, what you're doing with artificial intelligence. He was saying that, that um, people like me send in an Impergum and that you scan it and AI determines. Um, mm -hmm. um, so what, what are well, your... One of the scanning things, <clears throat> when you use polyvinyl siloxane, it'll get down in every little groove. It, it's just nasty stuff. It just crawls in the <laughs> sulcus, you know, and it copies everything. But when you're using a visible light scanner, it can't look into undercuts. So what we've done is we've come up with a computer tomography and we're able to see right through an impression as long as there's not a metal tray in there we can we could take a box with an impression in it scan the entire box without ever opening it and absolutely give you a detailed copy of the prep all the way down within 20 microns now this is unheard of with four or five years ago you know CT was about 200 microns now we've got it down to 20 we're now building our own CT units show you one today. We're building our own CT scanners and we can put an impression in there. We have one system downstairs now that we're, we're uh, on this floor, where are we at? Uh, that we're scanning the 200 and up to 230 impressions a day right now on this uh, robotic line that we've built. 230 impressions a day? Yeah, a day, yeah. It's a, a task we're doing for an outside company but I'll show you what it looks like, what it's doing right now. But, and that's because how many, how many impressions do you actually Oh, well, as you know, we, we get 90,000 a week. 90,000 impressions a week? Uh-huh, yeah. Wow. Uh, so, so that... Um, and I, of course, I look at all of them. Yeah? <laughs> so, um, on, on, those, uh, on those impressions, um, some people out there are saying that, um, that if you send in a scan, um, yeah. there's less remakes. Other well, there, people are yeah. saying if you send in um, an, the, the, the impression, it's, it's the same. Are, are there well, more or less remakes? I'll tell you. The, <clears throat> when you send in a scan, an intraoral scan, there are definitely less, less remakes. We've, we've come to that conclusion, and we do a lot of data analytics here. Um, if, you take, if you're an average dental lab, and some, some areas we do the same because we're not completely into CT scanning yet, we have to pour that model. Then we take the model and you know we die trim it, and every time the in, engineers will talk about error stack up, a stack up error is when you go from one material, then you have to go to another one, then you got to scan it again, and then you go to a casting, and you make even the 3D printers involved. Uh, each one of these, let's say you start off at 20 micron, by the time you get down to the fifth element of this process, it's 100 microns. And that's called care stack? It's, uh, called, it's called stack up error. Stack up error. Yeah, yeah. In other words, you know, how tight does a screw fit? And then, and if you make a thousand screws, but you never change the burr that cuts them, they get looser and looser and looser. Okay, so if you add up all these 20 micron errors, after five or six, there's a hundred micron error. And we know that the, we need to have 75 micron margins to put them in the mouth supposedly, and yet we know there's a lot of 200 microns. Thank God for the cements we're using today. You know, <laughs> it'll plug any gap in there. But uh, stack up air is the thing you're fighting. So when you take, if you give me a polyvinyl siloxane and I use a CT scanner on it, I go right through that, that impression and I go directly from, into a CAD program, design it, CAM program to machine it, 
and I will give you a product that will probably be within 20 to 30 microns. I've got a chance because I didn't go through the plaster. Your plaster is good on one day, maybe day two, the batch of plaster you got is a little different. So the expansion in 24 hours is a little different. Most dental labs don't eat, wait 24 hours to work on a model work. They start working on it within six or eight hours. And in reality, that stuff is supposed to set for 24 hours. So, you know. Uh, so they, is, they, is there any scanners, um, like, like anything, there's a lot, 3M has true dev. Um, um, you have uh, Copenhagen, Denmark has, um, Three shape. Um, yeah. You have um, all kinds well, of scanners. You I have your I own you, you know, audio uh, scanner. I've worked with the three shape guys in the past. They've got their Trios scanner. Very very nice. Very very good scanner. Got good color. Uh, they've grown from a couple of graduates out of a college over there into fifteen hundred employees now. Uh, dental labs around the world use them. Use their work. The TrueDef scanner. Very nice little scanner. Uh, I was backed by 3M, and I understand they've sold it off right now. And I haven't. Oh, they followed did much sell out. it off. Yeah, I believe 3M has sold it. The scanner now. Who? Who? Do you know who and bought I it? I don't or? know who bought that. Was it you? No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't have been a bad idea. We built our own scanner in San Diego uh, seven, eight years ago, and I had my head handed to me. Uh, it's a, it's a difficult business to be in, but because of that scanner that we bought, we then bought the software company in Russia that does all of our CAD CAM software out of Moscow. X. So you bought a Russian scanner? Yeah, well, no, I bought the company, the, uh, the, the software developers that write software for basically just dentistry. They're all, their background, they'd work for another company, an orthodontic company that does clear aligners. Invisalign? And, uh, and yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and they had moved, uh, Invisalign moved over to the Ukraine and the Moscow guys were ripe to do what we were doing and where, so where would you say Russia's Silicon Valley is? We, you it's, know, it's Moscow. Is, is it Moscow? I would think it's Moscow. Yeah. You think it's Moscow? Yeah. Um, you know a lot of people forget that Russians landed a droid on the moon first. They had the right. first Sputnik. They had the first dog in space, woman yep. in space. Yep. I mean they, it's Gagarin. an extremely high-tech country. Yeah. They, they're, they're not low-tech at all. Not at all. It's kind of like funny, I always think about Minnesota and Michigan and those northern states, how much precision engineering they do up there, even in the United States. You know, well, they, they're inside all year. <laughs> it's cold and snowing. Yeah, so I, I, want to go back, I want to switch to Invisalign for a second because um, it, it's a confusing. Um, I, um, I fell in love with you when I was in dental school, and I, um, I, I, I did because you seemed like the only guy that was a champion uh, I mean, I grew up with five sisters and a brother yeah. in Wichita, Kansas. My dad delivered rainbow bread. Yeah. So we were so poor. I didn't know that um, that people, you know, I, I, I thought only air conditioners were at the store. I was 10 years old before I realized that some people were so rich they had an air conditioner in their house. Yeah. And um, so here's the orthodontist. They all get 6,500 bucks. Invisalign comes out with clear liners, a great technology, but they work with the orthodontist. The price is still 6,500. And then someone comes out, smiles directly, and says, "You know what? We're going to go for twenty-five hundred, and we're going to do that. We're going to we're going to bypass the orthodontist. We're going to scan it. We're going to have AI read the impression, and um, just g give a four thousand dollar break to the little guy." And the orthodontist said, "Absolutely not." And they're trying to so so it's a war. But it, so but what do you think of that? It, is smiles direct trying to help? the poor guy or well, is this union busting with the rich orthodontist? How, how, how do you view this? I think, you know, you again, you had venture capital backed uh, concept. Uh, they went public, but their IPO was only uh, six, eight weeks, two months ago maybe. It, it fell precipitously and I had told people, this is a good little company actually. I kind of like their concept. But you know, in like the state of California, your CDA is fighting them tooth and nail to keep them out. They're not fighting them that way. They're saying, well, if you want to go Smile Direct Club, you need to go take a, a have an x-ray done by a real dentist first. So they're putting them a dentist in the way. So that's going to block I'm sure they didn't it. say real dentist. I'm sure they said real orthodontist. A real orthodontist. A you real orthodontist. You're right. And I understand. I mean, the orthodontist, that's, their, that's right. how they make a living. And so they're seeing Smile Direct Club is going around them. Um, and from a business standpoint, I think they've got a great business idea. Uh, I've even advised some people, friends of mine, they buy the stock because it's probably going to go. Darn thing went down almost 60%. But even yesterday, it was up 15%. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, so it's coming back. 
they signed a contract with Walmart. Uh, they've expanded into four countries in the Far East already. Just announced that uh, on Monday. So I think they're here to stay. But there's also four or five more right behind them chomping at their bitch, you know. Well, I think like Smile Direct Club's issue is setting up an office where you do an intraoral scan, and that's where the dental boards are getting upset about that. They're saying, no, you should be going to an orthodontist office and getting an intraoral scan. Well, then, then why are you going to use Smile Club Direct? Whereas there's two or three others behind Smile Club Direct, other companies like Bite and whatnot, they're saying you don't have to do that. We're going to send you a home impression kit. So it's direct to consumer, and it's catching on a lot bigger than I thought it would. Uh, so the, one, it's, one of the it's dropping the price. Is it good for dentistry? You know, it's not good for dentist. It's yeah. probably good for patients. Wow, thank you so much for that, Mr. Glidewell and Dr. Ferran. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a great conversation, and we can't wait for the last remaining part of it coming up very soon, so stay tuned. But before I go, I want to invite you to earn some free CE credit. Wow. Yeah, you can head to GlidewellDental.com, and there's tons of courses. Which course do you recommend? I'm thinking today, how about Meridium Dentistry, Engagement and Retention by Dr. Chad Duplantis. Hey, you better get on over there and check it out. But for today, we're all wrapped up. So on behalf of everyone here at Glybal Dental, thank you so much for watching. We'll meet you right back here next time.